Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Hi, everyone. Hi, friends. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Even if all you do is take a few seconds to like and subscribe, it's a Bodhisattva act. It helps us propagate these, this resource for the proper teachings of uh, Nichiren's insights into Shakyamuni's Lotus Sutra Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, today, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction into a version of the Lotus Sutra I've had for many, many years as a, podi as a, po as a PDF, uh, but reading off a computer, it's just not for me. I know it's really popular these days, and... Um, you know, I was uh, skimming again through this book, which I have read uh, excerpts from in the past. Um, this is a, a, uh, a book of several scholars uh, edited by Stephen F. Tizer and Jacqueline um, I. Stoke, um, Stone. I don't know why I can't speak this morning. <laughs> but Jacqueline Stone is... Uh, uh, somebody I've read from before. She's a very, uh, she's a contemporary of ours. She's a very erudite uh, scholar of uh, medieval Japan and uh, several aspects of medieval Japan, uh, Japan and certainly uh, with regard to Nitrin. So yes, I've read from her before. I have several of her books, her dissertations on the questionable uh, origin of some of uh, the Go Show, uh, that the aren't fully authenticated, are either in Nitrin's hand or um, in his voice as um, uh, written by like senior disciples close to him. And uh, I've mentioned that while reading the Go Show and uh, Nitrin Go Show, the first run through of the Go Show Zenshu, as opposed to the Go Show, um, the. Um, I forget what it's called now, but the the uh, organization that uh, Nichiren Shu started for propagation, they have uh, many, many of the same uh, Gosho, but they have uh, some that they've got in certain collections that the Zen Shu uh, doesn't have. So uh, I felt like I needed to start to, to do that uh, Nichiren Gosho 2, T double O, so clever. Um, but I couldn't complete it because it, it's just so full of improper rhetoric that I, there's really no use going through them. But I did go through several that I thought were meaningful, and um, the meaning is in there. What I wanted to point out is even in the Zenshu, um, there's a couple of them where you can just hear. It, it's not Nitrin's voice. You can you read enough Go Show and you hear Nitrin's voice, right? Anyway, I make that point because... Uh, something that uh, Jacqueline pointed out, where was it, about uh, translations of uh, the, uh, the Lotus Sutra. And she said that the excerpts they used in this study, in this book, was um, specifically the uh, Leon Hurwitz edition, because in their opinion and I respect their opinion greatly, um, the uh, Leon Hurwitz translation is the most, should I say, accurate, um, the most faithful. I'll say it that way. I wanted to quote her directly, but I'm having trouble finding the entry now. Uh, to the Chinese... Uh, translation of Kumarajiva. And I thought, well, you know, that Kumarajiva translated directly from, here it is, directly from the Sanskrit, one of the many languages that uh, transcribed the Lotus Sutra. And Kumarajiva undoubtedly did his research, so it's the most authoritative translation that most, if not all, most, uh, great, uh, uh, modern translators use. So here she says, uh, 
The scripture of the Lotus Blossom of the Fine Dharma, the Lotus Sutra, translated from the Chinese of Kumarajiva, records records of civilization, sources and studies, uh, 94, translations from the Asian classics, New York, Columbia Press, 1976, and revised in 2009. Um, and darn it, that's not... That's not where she makes that statement, darn it. Anyway, she was talking about um, uh, his uh, faithfulness to the translation, uh, to the uh, Sanskrit text. Um, at any rate, I've gone ahead and ordered that one in print form, because when I do these videos, having a print form that I can re read and read ahead and mark and you know make notes is very valuable to me. Not so easy to do with electronic copies. Maybe it will be one day. Maybe I still won't do it. <laughs> anyway, today, uh, what I have, in, instead of that PDF to read from, I actually ordered the, uh, the BDK version of the Lotus Sutra. Unfortunately, the BDK and the Tripitaka uh, people, uh, they're very scholarly and very dedicated to doing an accurate job. But in the Lotus Sutra, they do not include the opening and closing sutras. What are you going to do? Which is why I use the, uh, what is it? Um, the Kobe, ah, that, man, my memory. Anyway, I use the Threefold Lotus Sutra book, which is available anywhere, Amazon, the biggest bookstore in the world, right? Um, and I've shown it in the Lotus Lectures. You'll know which book. I have the ISBNs in those videos and all of that. But um, we this is just a 28-chapter version of Kumarajivas, right? And they, they say in here, and there's an interesting note in here that I, I wanted to read today just as a an introduction. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing. I just want to read this particular part because you hear me talk about uh, cultural bias, organizational bias, author, author bias. Um, and it, it's just, it's everywhere. It's not that it can be escaped or that I want to impugn those people as having nefarious uh, motivations. Some might. Uh, th there have been books written on Buddhist translations that are, a concerted effort to demonstrate how Buddhism is inferior to Christianity. So, yeah, <laughs> it's there. Um, but just, I want to read just their rhetoric without my imposition on it, and you will hear. Uh, it's, it's very obvious that they make decisions based on what they want to base them on. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not scholarly or, or uh, you know, It's hard to call it wrong. What is wrong is for us to go into these translations as though they were the word-by-word, -word, authentic words of Shakyamuni. Nobody has that, no matter what. I don't care if it's Pali, sorry, for those of you who think those are the only true teachings, or, or Gandhari uh, text uh, languages or whatever. Nobody knows the exact words except those people who memorize the teachings over and over again for hundreds of years. That's how Buddhism was spread. And then at some point, for fear of losing the correct teachings, like maybe somebody was reciting and thinking, does it say that or this? And, you know, made people nervous. They started, the elite, the people with money, would hire transcribers to transcribe the oral teachings into written word in different languages, and they would bury them in clay pots in the ground to preserve them for the future. This was a practice, a common practice. And about two decades ago in Gandhara, the northeast region of India, well, it's now several countries, but at that time it was India, uh, a find, an archaeological find, was made of many, many sutras in this. Some, in pretty good conditions, many had to be restored because they were folded and put into the clay pots, right? And that was quite a, a huge resource, right? 
it became obvious that there was a period in that in that area of India that was a center of Buddhism, a Buddhist thinking. Yeah. So anyway, there's a publisher's forward here that I'm going to read from, just a couple of paragraphs, just to prepare you for yet another series on the Lotus Sutra. And by the way, since it's been such a long time since I did the Lotus Lectures and various, uh, under the playlist of Lotus Sutra, there are all manner of videos, but the Lotus Lectures are specific the threefold Lotus Sutra. And some have asked, what's threefold? The, the threefold is the opening sutra, the 28 chapters of the Lotus Sutra, and the closing sutra. Okay? That's threefold. Um, it's the name of our Sangha. This won't be threefold, but it'll be the Lotus Sutra. And this will give me another opportunity. Hopefully, it won't read too difficult because they've got Indian names in here that can be. Pff, 40, 50 letters long, Ugh, they get really, it's like a sentence is your name, it, literally. And um, when I receive the, um, the Leon Hurwitz translation, I'm not sure if I should do them separately or mix them. I'll probably do them separately. So there'll be a playlist for this Lotus Sutra there'll be a playlist for the Leon Hurwitz Lotus Sutra. And that way, you'll have, because I'm translating or transcribing, all not transcribing, capturing all the audio of these videos into podcasts. Those of you who have, for myriad reasons, difficulty uh, reading uh, text in a, on screen or in a book, uh, you'll be able to listen. It'll be almost like audio books, except... It'll be me interjecting all the time. You know how I do. <laughs> and, uh, but you'll have several sources. And I'm, I'm positive because I've already got five versions I used going through the uh, Lotus Lectures series. Uh, these two, although I'll make them distinctly separate, that's what I'm thinking right now, um, you'll be able to see that the message, the clarity of it comes through. Uh, with the benefit of several more experience, years of experience talking to you guys and uh, developing my, my own rhetoric about Shakyamuni's teaching. Yeah. So here's the publisher's forward of the BDK, uh, the Tripitaka effort of this society to transfer all of the teachings of Shakyamuni to the modern audience of the West. On behalf of the members of the publication committee, I am happy to present this volume as the latest contribution to the BDK English Tripitaka series. The three baskets, yeah? The publication committee members have worked to ensure that each volume in the series has gone through a, a rigorous succession of editorial and bookmaking efforts. The initial translation and editing of the Buddhist scriptures found in this and other BDK English Tripitaka volumes are performed under the direction of the editorial committee in Tokyo, Japan, chaired by Professor Sengaku Maeda, Professor Emeritus of uh, Musashino University. Both the editorial committee in Tokyo and the publication committee headquartered in Berkeley, California, are dedicated to the production of clear, readable English, hmm, think about what they mean by that, texts of the Buddhist canon. Now, I'm sure they're honorable and that's actually what they want to do, but understand that that obviates that there's going to be interpolation. In doing so... The members of both committees and associate staff work to honor the deep faith, spirit, and concern of the late Reverend Dr. Yehan Numata, who founded the BDK English Tripitaka series in order to disseminate Buddhist teachings throughout the world. There's that word faith, right? We just talked about that. 
The long-term goal of our project is the translation and publication of the text in the 100-volume Taisho edition of the Chinese Buddhist canon, along with a few influential extra-canonical Japanese text, Buddhist texts. The list of texts listed or selected for the first series of this translation project may be found in the end of each volume in the series. So we can go through that. It's in the book. As recently appointed chair of the publication committee, I am deeply honored to serve the post formerly held by the late Dr. Philip B. Ayampolsky, who was so good to me during his lifetime, the esteemed Dr. Kenneth K. Inada, who had such great impact on Buddhist studies in the United States, and the beloved late Dr. Francis H. Cook, a dear friend and colleague. Do, 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 do. That is not what I wanted to read, but still good information. Again, they keep repeating. The one thing I want to read that's in, uh, that I think is important is um, the selection of the text. They, they use the Taisho, the, the Chinese record, like Tendai, that cleaned up that record of the canon, Buddhist canon, right? Created the five periods, got away with or did away with erroneous teachings and, came, and uh, pared it down to what could justifiably be called Shakyamuni's actual teachings, right? That's the Taisho in China. And they're using that Taisho in order to pull those translations, those uh, uh, specific texts, they call them scriptures in here, mm. um, to translate for us, calling it the Tripitaka, yeah? Okay. But then, in the very next sentence, they say that that's not the translation they're using. <laughs> A monumental task of da 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 da. Oh, I should have marked this. Anyway, they're using a different translation from a royal family that they got. Maybe they just have better access to that one. They claim in the book that the differences are so minor as to be irrelevant. Okay, we can only hope, right? We don't know. At least they're being straightforward about it. All right? And they're saying wherever they had to, they accommodated the translation to keep the meaning faithful, quote-unquote, right? So there it is, my friends. I don't accuse them of anything. I'm simply stating the fact that you and I need to be aware of when we read or listen to these texts. They are not word-by-word Shakyamuni they are meaningful, and they are captured for some, somebody's reasoning that we need to hear things in a certain way in order for our Western minds to get it. And you know what? Some of that, that's arguably what I'm doing. Yeah? I would add the proviso were I writing a foreword for my own book, I would add to what they're saying, because what they're saying is wrong, but it obviates the need for one other piece of information. That every effort I make in this regard will be to remove the stigma of the charismatic words that lead one astray or outside of Buddhist thought. That is my primary mission in these videos, in my books, on the threefoldlotus.com website, in everything I do, even the mandala. I refuse to use a mandala by Frank or Peter or Kokyo or whatever they're called today, leading an organization, because they put their own signatures on that mandala along with important dates for themselves. That's not Nichiren. That's you. I'm not, I'm not worshiping 
an individual. I am awakening my Buddha nature. No worship, I'm manifesting. And if you're on my mandala, you're a distraction. The only one I want on my mandala is the guy who created it, Nichiren. That's who I'm practicing with. That's my mentor. That's my teacher. So I'm very adamant that if you really want to practice correctly, get a simile, a digital accurate representation of an actually scribed, inscribed Nichiren mandala. Don't mess around with the other stuff. What are you doing? It's already obfuscated. That's why all that argumentation between different organizations on whose is best and which one to use, there's only one. Yeah, I'm a strict Nietzscheanist. Deal with it. Nietzschean, if you read his Go Show at all, pretty darn strict. Because... Look at how many times Buddhism has been led astray. For what? For egos? For political power? To create religions out of them? No, thank you. I've had my fill of religions. I've talked about that before, too. So anyway, this book, as I said earlier, The Lotus Sutra, Begins straight away with chapter one. No opening sutra, no immeasurable meanings, just right into the sutra. And I guess just for uh, what I would normally say, shits and grins. <laughs> Maybe I'll read a little bit today. All right, we'll give it about 10 minutes. We'll get started, okay? Chapter one, introduction. Thus have I heard... Once the Buddha was say, staying in the city of Baj, uh, Rajgra, here we go, Rajagra, on the mountain called oh, Grarakuta. Wow. Together with a great assembly of 12,000 monks, all of whom were arhats, whose corruption was at an end, who were free from the confusion of desire who had achieved their own goals, shattered the bond of existence, and attained complete mental discipline. Their names were Ajnatakaudinya, Mahakashyapa, there's a familiar one, Uravilva Kashyapa. Wait a minute. You just said there were 12,000. Are you going to give me all 12,000 names? Vakula, Nanda, Subhuti, Ananda, Rahula, Whew. All right, they stopped there. Thank you. All of them were great arhats known to the assembly. There were, in addition, 2,000 others, both those who had more to learn and those who did not. The nun Mahaprajabati was there, together with her 6,000 attendants. Wow. And also the nun Yashodara, Rahula's mother, together with her attendants. So let's just pause there for a moment and consider what that first paragraph is about. I've mentioned this before. These sutras, they start establishing who this teaching is being taught to. That's vital. That's vitally important. It's not just a flex. Look at how many people I'm talking to, right? These are types of people. There are hots. They're nuns. They're shravakas, right? They're people of learning. They're people who've accomplished. They're people of pratyaka buddha. They're people of those two worlds, incorrigible as they are, which we later find out in the teachings, can't attain buddhahood because they're arrogant. They think they know what they don't know. Arhats are not fully enlightened people although they think they are, and that's the problem. So the attendants, see, we know this because we're late Mahayanists, right? We practice the Lotus Sutra. So even in the Lotus Sutra, it begins here. It will expand as others join. In other words, the teachers get more profound, the teaching gets more profound 
as new p- attendants, personages, mindsets join in the audience. You see the mechanism? It's important to realize this. So arhats, people who feel accomplished, and yet they're there. So they're there. They must know there's more to learn. Certainly that's the position that Shakyamuni puts them in, right? And his, his friends and family, right? This is a 6,000 attendants, but... Uh, for one person, but still kind of an intimate gathering, right? It's not from all over the world, other lands, da, 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 all potential minds. This is for where we're at now. I'm teaching to these people, right? When we talk about teaching to the capacity and the time, this is what we're talking about. Makes sense, right? There were also 80,000 Bodhisattva Mahasattvas. Oh, that changes the color of the audience now. All of whom were irreversible from highest complete enlightenment. Amnutara Samyak Sambolai. Ah, so the Arhats are already, hmm, these guys supposedly know more than we do. Right? A little ego still in there because they still are attached to a self, which... And a note on self, because I I get emails about this sporadically. I keep going back to the basics of Buddhist teaching. Just if you're ever not understanding a concept, go back to the Four Noble Truths. As we attain our enlightenment, our awakening, we don't eliminate anything. We don't. The conversations and the teachings about soul, self, identity, are make a distinction, which we don't in samsara. When we say self in samsara, we see it as a solid container of characteristics right oh i'm this kind of person i'm that kind of we talk about ourselves like we're a vehicle an actual thing oh yeah yeah, yeah. i change moment to moment but that's i that's me that's who i am right all that rhetoric and what buddhism says is stop for a moment and consider as I've gone over ad nauseum, moment to moment, you're re-instantiating from a freight train of characteristics, tendencies and conditions, not characteristics, tendencies and conditions, that characteristics is only one of ten factors of the manifestation of each of those little minute energies forming formations, remember, into a momentary instantiation of what that looks like, what that looks like, what that looks like. That's why it's called rebirth. It's a rehashing, a re-instantiation, albeit from the one moment to the next, there's a slight opportunity to influence, to redirect, to slough off, right? So it happens moment to moment, faster than you can think. That's why it's important to stay awakened so that we can influence all of that karma in the direction of full awakening, right? So in that, in that teaching, the self is something that really doesn't exist because it's constantly being modified, moment to moment, moment to moment, moment to moment. You could call it a selfness, like a suchness. Oh, now you're talking in terms that are more indicative of the process. So the whole conversation about no self isn't about eliminating a self because the self doesn't exist. The self as an extant thing is a samsaric delusion. 
but the self as a constantly constructed and reconstructed moment-to-moment process, that's valid. That's what we're awakening. That's what we're influencing. You can't attain Buddhahood if you can't change, right? Self-realization, self-manifestation of our Buddha awareness. So we don't get rid of the self. What we get rid of, if we're going to use those words, is the permanentizing, the selfizing, the at clinging and craving for noble truths. Cease the clinging and craving. Not cease what you're clinging and craving. Stop your metabolism thinking mind from clinging and craving and just be with the momentum. It's the same thing, but perceived completely differently. That's why I included the word epistemology in this book. In the, I'm sorry, the book uh, Buddhism Reference. Not because I want to flex, ooh, look, I know this word, but because it's a word that's a label for a whole area of study, not unlike, go back to Vasubandhu or Nagarjuna, the exhaustive peering into the mechanisms of thought, how the mind works. Epistemology is a very useful modern scientific investigation into how human beings construct thought, right? So does that make sense? I hope it does. Is that people get really hung up on that word self. Why? It's one of our most basic identifiers. You hear me talk about identity all the time. So re-understand these terms so that they suit and fit with the Dharma, with the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, yeah? Okay. Uh, that's a little over half an hour. So, yeah, I'm going to stop there. And we'll continue next time. I didn't get very far, but this is an introductory video. So hopefully you get the idea what I want to do here. Let me know your thoughts. Hey, maybe, uh, maybe you'll think, no, I think I want them to mix up. Uh, maybe you like that format. And when I get the uh, Leon Hurwitz edition, maybe I'll, I'll go back and forth between them. I don't know. I think there's some... There's also a lot of utility to a video that, uh, series that's just dedicated to this particular one, yeah? So I think that's what I'm going to start off with, but I, I want to hear from you guys, so let me know, okay? In the meantime, thank you for supporting me. Like and subscribe. Uh, if any of these uh, uh, videos uh, are appealing to you, but again, don't forget they're free podcasts that might be easier for you to deal with. Uh, to use and uh, anything you can do. Uh, this resource is about helping you attain resolve, confidence, know that you're invoking your Buddha nature and that you're practicing correctly. That's what this is about. If you can uh, do anything uh, as far as buying ebooks or print books, uh, the correct mandala and uh, or patrons on Patreon or PayPal. You're the, you're the folks who are uh, helping me keep this going. There are costs for everything these days. I'm surprised we're allowed to breathe for free. <laughs> I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> anyway, in that regard, please take care of your health. Be kind to yourself. Yeah, And uh, I will see you in the next one. Undoubtedly. <laughs> All right. Bye for now. I like to be educated, but I'm so frustrated. Hello to my loneliness.